Hi guys, and welcome to today's Facebook Live. I hope that you are having an amazing day so far, whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Um, so if you're joining me live, let me know who you are and where you're from. I should have Dr. Martina Nidhart joining me tonight, but uh, we all know that delays happen and I haven't heard I haven't heard from her yet. We spoke, we spoke and connected this morning, so hopefully she will be here shortly. Um, in the meantime, I hope that you will keep me company for a few minutes and we can touch base on a few other things. So tonight with Dr. Neathart, we should be chatting about ECVM. I would love to go solo on the subject and just share some of my own knowledge and understanding on it. But unfortunately, ECVM is definitely not something that I know enough about to go solo on. So I'd love to invite you if you're interested in the subject. Hopefully you are because you're here with me. Hi, Nadia. It's great to have you with us. Um, if you're interested in the subject, whether that is from a professional perspective or a personal perspective, please let me know, share your experience with ECVM or equine cervical vertebral malformation with us in the comments. I'd love to know um, what you've experienced around this, what you know about it. Uh, let's have a little bit of a conversation about ECVM coming from you guys and your knowledge and experience. I'd love to hear from you. So that Sharon May Davies has been doing a lot of um, research on this based on dissections, which is very in interesting. Uh, have have I ever treated a patient with con this condition? No, um, not diagnosed. I have had some, you know, undiagnosed, interesting neurological cases, but not not a diagnosed ECVM. No, which is why I'm not really. I can't really go solo on the subject and chat to you guys about it, but hopefully Dr. Needhart will join us, Dr. Martina will join us soon. Um, in the meantime, I can let you guys know that we are getting really excited. I hope you've noticed how really excited we're getting about our Vet Rehab Amid coming up soon. We're planning to open ticket sales mid-July. So if everything goes according to plan, and right now, all smooth sailing, um, we'll be opening those ticket sales in July. But here's the important thing. Hi, it's so great to have you with us. If you're joining us from a group, so from the Equine Vet Rehabbers Facebook group, please allow StreamYard to see who you are so that I know who I'm chatting to. I'd love to be able to see your names, but all I can see is um, Facebook user. So that's what I can see from my side. So if you're on the group, please just allow StreamYard uh, permission to see who you are because our groups are private. They're professional groups. Um, we You can't share out of them. That's for your benefit as professionals so that you can have conversations in there about uh, clients, not clients, about patients, about cases, any challenges that you're experiencing. So those groups are private. You do have to grant me permission to see who you are. Let me know who you are. Hi, guys. I see we have quite a few people live with us. So if you're live with us, we I hope that we will be speaking about ECVM tonight, equine cervical vertebral malformation. Please, if you have any questions, post them in the comments. If you have any experience, post it in the comments. Like Nadia, Nadia says, have you ever treated a patient with this condition? So I'd love to hear from you guys. Have you treated any patients with ECBM? What has your experience been with that? I would really love to know how it has worked out for you. How severe was the case? Um, was it a case that had to be euthanized at the end of the day or did they manage to come to a place of function where they could live a yeah a functional good quality life or that, that not happen for the case or some of the cases that you have seen let us know um dr needhart is martina needhart is delayed or um yeah, I'm not sure because I haven't been able to get in touch with her this evening, but hopefully she's just delayed and she'll join us shortly. So 
this is what I can do for you guys. <laughs> um, I would love to give you a little sneak peek into our members portal. So if you're unfamiliar with who Online Pet Health is and what we do at Online Pet Health, it's so great to have you join us. Um, we, oh, thank you, Pat, Patty. Let's, let's read this. Okay. I recently attended a dissection in South Carolina Carolina with Sharon May Davies. She found significant changes at T1 and particularly the first rib. She pointed out that it's not just cervical anymore. She says equine complex vertebral malformation. That's very interesting, uh, Patty. We, we actually hope to get Sharon May Davies lecturing for us soon, and then we'll be able to hear more from her personally on what she's finding in these dissections. Um, even though quite a bit of it she has published, but it is it is very interesting to think that um, yeah these these malformations are just becoming more and more widespread, and I'd love to know why. I'd love to know where is that coming from? Are we just being very irresponsible as breeders? Um, is it because of what we're looking for in our performance horses? Is this only occurring in our performance horses or is it occurring in more than just our performance horses? It's it's quite concerning. I, I have to say it's it's a scary thought to think that more and more of our horses will have or have this, are being diagnosed with this and are not necessarily surviving, right, to to have functional lives. And um, that's the part that's really scary to me is that many, many, many of them have to be put down at the end of the day because they're not functional and they're not able to um, live and work and be in this world that we've created for them. Uh, will this be available to watch at another date? Yes. Um, I'm so sorry that you've had a family emergency and I really, I, I wish you luck. That's very difficult. Um, yes, this recording will be available. I'm going to stay on for about 10 minutes or so. Um, you're hoping that Dr. Nidhart joins us. Um, if she doesn't, then I will hop off and reschedule with her uh, because, you know, life does happen. <laughs> we all know this. We work with horses. We work with patients and with clients. Uh, our days are full of unexpected delays um, and things that happen and that prevent us from doing the things that we want to do and love to do. So hopefully she'll be with us soon. Otherwise, I want to give you a little sneak peek into what is in our equine membership. So if you have, if you are not familiar with online pet health and with what we do, let me tell you a little bit about us. We are, uh, that's the one. Okay, so we provide continuing education to animal rehabilitation therapists all around the world. Um, we have three memberships. So we have a we have a small animal, an equine and a hydrotherapy membership. And you can subscribe to only one if you're only treating, you know, horses, or to all three if you're seeing all three, you know, all patient populations. Um, if you're if you are a if you if you sign up to the small animal and the equine, we actually give you the hydro platform for free. Um, it's not actually often that someone who is treating dogs and horses is also working in hydrotherapy in a large portion of their time, potentially just some of their day. So what we provide for our members through online pet health is continuing education in the form of monthly webinars and all of those webinars are added into a webinar library and we have oh my gosh I think we have about 400 CPD registered webinars across the platform right now although I don't have those numbers with me which is amazing it's like almost 300 in yeah it's a it's a lot it's a lot so we we basically have anything that you're looking for within rehabilitation our small animal library is very complete. Our equine library is still being built and still growing. It is the newest of the three memberships. And the Hydro library is also pretty complete and pretty comprehensive. Um, every month we add two new webinars, we add a research refresh, and we add business basics training. So this month, 
Um, our newest webinars are Body Work for Foals and Young Horses with Raquel Butler. Um, I've watched this and it is amazing. I love working with foals. I love working with young horses. I feel that there is such a big opportunity for us to influence their long-term welfare and health if we can work with their bodies as youngsters and we can impact their symmetry and their straightness and their movement and how they're using their bodies um that it's just it's there's such a big opportunity so this is a this is a a big one for me one that i'm really passionate about and excited about um, and then we have our final webinar in the equine tendon series with Gillian Tabor. And this one looks at, looks at complex tendon or ligament injuries in other areas of the body, because generally we think of tendon and ligament injuries and we're thinking of the distal limbs um, and what's happening below the carpus and below the hock. But there are things like uh, peroneus tertius injuries and um, biceps injuries and... <sighs> Yeah, the sacro tuberous ligament and the supraspinous ligament and the interspinous ligaments and, 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 and. So there is much more that we can think about when we're thinking about tendon and ligament injuries. And we can be unprepared for those unexpected ones if they come, if we come across them. Um, and so Jillian prepares us a little bit for the unexpected uh, in clinical practice, but so this is, a, this is a fantastic one for us to end off the series. And it is sponsored by Response Systems, which we love. We love Response Systems. I think uh, Meg has a Response System unit. I have a Response Systems unit. Um, I love my Response Systems unit. So great. And then our research article this month is Accelerometric Changes Before and After Capacitive resistors, Resistive Electric Transfer Therapy in horses with thoracolumbar pain compared to a sham procedure. Um, so that's uh, Indiba therapy for those of us who want to speak English. <laughs> Indiba therapy, looking at very mild thoracolumbar pain in horses that are competing compared to a sham um, or a control group with a sham treatment. So an interesting paper worth reading and worth looking at if you're interested in this modality. Um, our business basics training this month, planning for growth values, growth values in your business with Francisco Maya. And this one was really interesting. Um, it's it's definitely worth watching if you are, if you have recently expanded, if you're planning on expanding, if you're planning on adding something new to your business. Um, it's, yeah, our businesses go through dips and peaks. And if we're trying to reach that next peak, we're often going to go through a dip as we need to readjust to our commitments and to 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 how we reach that goal. Um, and so he speaks about that and how we can how we can look at that and work with that. Um, and then and then finally in July we have the influence of scars and muscles muscle tears in the equine body with Dr. Raquel Butler. This is also brilliant. I've watched it. I get to take a sneak peek um, in, at most of our webinars and at all of our webinars. And so this is fantastic. Scars and muscle tears in the body. Um, let's think about profit thump, profit thumbprints. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, equine postural stability and my hands are my greatest tool. It will be our palpation, um, will be our research refresh. And our business basics next month is from uh, from Francisco Maya again. So really, really good stuff. Let me check in with you guys quickly. Hi, Meg. It's so cool to have you here with us. Welcome. And da -da -da. hi, Julie. <laughs> awesome, guys. So if you have any questions about ECVM, because that is what we're here to talk about today, please ask them. Even if Dr. Martina doesn't join me tonight, I am going to do my best to answer those for you after the broadcast. So I'll have a look at um, each of your questions and see if I can find that information and we can chat about that and share that over the next couple of days. Um, and we can continue to have the conversation about ECVM because it's definitely something that I want to learn about. Um, and then just the last sneak peek into our library. So here I've shown you just basically the newest 
um, the newest content we've released and then what's coming up next month. But if you scroll down, you can see we have a bunch of categories. So we divide our, our webinars and our content into categories. Um, and then within each category, you will have a couple of webinars and you will have a couple of research articles. Um, and if there has been a past summit on the subject, you'll have that as well. So this is a great, yeah, the, <laughs> this is a great way to find content that's in our library, webinars that are in our library. If you're looking for something specific, groundwork exercises, conditioning, uh, endurance horses, some really, really good stuff in here. And each of our categories will be filled with webinars and with, um, and with, research refreshes um, and it's pretty cool that in our membership we can bookmark things that we want to watch or um, and things that we're in the process of watching are bookmarked and we can add content to our watch list so if there's something you want to come back to later you can you can start that and add that to your watch list um, you can very easily access bus the business basics so the business section of the membership and um, yeah anything else that you're looking for all of our past Vet Rehab Summits are shared in the Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I'm uh, just having a little bit of an internet issue. So here, hi, please wait, Martina is live. Hi guys, and sorry about that. My internet is giving me some trouble. Welcome, Martina. It's so great to have you. I am very sorry about that. It seems no. I'm still working on the times. <laughs> oh no, time differences. Time differences it's can be hours such hours a challenging one. thing. Oh, yeah, I'm very sorry, sorry about <laughs> that. All right, guys. So let's jump right into our chat. Into our chat. Um. We're here to speak about equine cervical vertebral malformation. Martina, thank you for joining us and for sharing your um, experience and knowledge in this area. So if you will please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your interest in ECVM, that would be great. Yeah, so my name uh, is Martina Neidhardt. I'm originally from Switzerland, working currently in Ireland in an equine clinic that specialized in sports medicine and rehabilitation. Um, we, I have an interest in ECVM since about 10 years when I saw the first cases because I had horses with lamenesses that couldn't be explained or, you know, like they have problems getting muscle and building up and, and working properly and, and keeping tension in their abdominal um, core muscles um, without having bad training you know like usually when you do the training correct then your horse should be able to do the exercises but these horses were not able 
and I couldn't understand why. So I started to look mm -hmm. into it. And Sharon May Davis is one of the first researchers we had who actually published papers about that. Uh, and that's now over 10 years back when the first ones came out. And uh, now we have more and more research going into it, especially also in the area of Germany. Now, even yesterday, the um, yesterday the uh, um, the Association of the Hanoveraners um, Breeding Association um, published that they are going to look into it, and also the genetic link that it has, because there seemed to be quite a big problem about that. Okay. Um, ECVM is, I don't know if you explained about it already. No, I haven't. I'm, I'm definitely, this is not an area that I have enough knowledge in. So please tell us what is ECVM and, and how do these horses present? So what are the signs so that we should be looking ECVM, out for? ECVM is um, equine complex cervical malformation. Previously, it was named congenital cervical malformation. Um, but now it's just, they just changed the name, the shortage stayed the same. Um, we know it has, it affects C6, C7, T1, and the first ribs. Um, what it does is like, this is the area where we have the neck, where it changes um, like this. Part of the neck is also, especially the first ribs are weight bearing. This is where we have very important attachments of muscles from our, our core muscles. Um, C6 is a very, very important cervical. It's the biggest cervical that we have lower down that is stabilizing. It has some um, protrusions where we actually have the um, muscle of the longus collie coming around and it is responsible to lift up the chest and lower the neck. This is what this muscle is doing. So it's really an important part that we need to do this. Um, when we have a cervical malformation, we have transposition of some of the lamina that are, are, are supposed to be on C6 that either are fully gone or are gone on C6 and transposed on C7. So that means we have a different lever. Our longus collie will be weaker, but it still can do the function. When we go into the territory of being badly affected by ECVM, we do not have those um, protrusions or lamina on C6. We don't have them on C7. So there's no possibility to change the angulation and for the longus collie to attach and go around. Um, so we have a full weakness. Longus collie will be quite weak on those um, horses because it can only attach to soft tissue and other muscles, but not mm. to something that's really stable. If it gets even worse, we go back and see that the first strips are either missing um, or are just partially there, or they can even be double headed and just like very solid on one side and nothing on the other. If you just think about biomechanically, uh, what that does is like what I've seen in horses who were affected like that. If you ask them to do belly tuck, mm -hmm. what happens, these horses will always bend to one side. Because if you think what the muscle does when we do them to contract your abdominal sling is if it if it's stable on one side and weak mm -hmm. on the other, it always gonna rotate. So what happens when we always, because it's a coupling motion, if something's rotating, it's also bending. A, anything that is on the cervical spine because we have a coupled motion. So if it's rotating, it's bending. So these horses will always do that when you ask them to do a belly tack equally mm -hmm. because they can't. It's just biomechanically impossible for those horses. And those who have no um, rib here and a very strong one here, for these horses, it's going to be very, very difficult to bend to the side where they have the strong ribs. Because here is kind of like a blockage and very strong and here's a weak muscle so if you have to bend now to this side where you have your strong part 
they need to lift up even more to be able to bend and this is like not there because we have a very weak thoracic sling on that side because the attachments are just not there because if if those the cervicals do also miss often the dorsal part the spinous processes so your scalenius can't attach your longus colic can't attach properly your longissimus who's coming from the top and is supposed to attach on your c60 75 can only partially attach because there's nothing there to attach for those so it will all be just soft tissue um attachments and I think a lot of the horses that um, Solange is seeing that have those problems in the cervical part are just too weak and rotate and contract because mm -hmm. there is not enough stability there. Because these horses with ECVM, if they're severely affected, they do miss stability. The other thing what happens is they do have changed sensitivity. So either you have a reduced sensitivity so if you kind of like see if you if you do some some tests on their skin they can't feel they literally can't feel their feet because the innervation is gone because some of the nerves don't um when they come out they're either pinched or don't have enough room or sometimes they can have like too much pressure from the rib or from the muscles who are contracting to try to stabilize it. And then you just get a reduced innervation. Those horses have the tendency to stumble. They often don't know where their feet are. So they're slightly ataxic without having an actual problem further up. You also get like that you have like steps in it when the bones are not 100% correct there or because the stability is missing to stabilize your lower neck. So they have the tendency to just slide a little bit. This can be very deceiving because if you do then a CT um, and neck CTs are still done laterally in, in lateral recumbency on their fully sedated horse, they often do not look that bad because the horses do not have gravity working against them because we can't do the lower neck the CT for the lower neck standing. We only can do the X-ray standing for that. We do not see the extent of what it's happening because we're, we're not having the gravity acting on the body and that gives us a false positive often. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it. That does sound quite complex. And like, there is a lot that is involved. So it's not just, you know, one abnormality, but multiple abnormalities and the horses could have any range of, yes, of and, but it's, it's those really changes that, within that area, really in that area between C6 and yeah. T1 and the first strip. And that mm -hmm. has like, because it's such an important area where our plexus brachialis nerves come out throughout mm -hmm. the innervation for the full front leg, um, it's, it is a really critical area for function of the horse. The mm -hmm. other thing is what happens when they get weak in their muscles, they often are a little bit like that. What you see, they have often the shoulders mm -hmm. back, you yeah. have a protruding chest. What that does in addition is like, because everything is so narrow, the stomach gets pulled back and out of alignment. These mm -hmm. horses often have recurrent ulcers that can't be explained with stress. Because what happens when everything's that narrow, the stomach gets pushed back a little bit and slightly rotated. So areas of the stomach that are not supposed to be constantly under um, acid because it's the, the non-glandular part, will constantly have a little bit of splash where they shouldn't have it because it's not aligned like what it would be when it has enough space and is a little bit further back. So this is another thing that we regularly see with those horses that they have problems with ulcer, recurrent problems, and not just because of stress and pain, but also because of actual physical torsion that happens because of the contraction that we see in the cervix and in the chest area mm -hmm. sure these that's horses, very interesting yeah these horses often have like you see often um elbow in 
and slight mm -hmm. rotation out in the feet, even if they are kind of like toeing, but it still looks like they're standing like this because they're doing mm -hmm. that just to stabilize here. Gives you very tight neck muscles over the withers, the neck, brachiocephalicus, pectoralis, everything feels like it's under a lot of tension, mm -hmm. but weak. Okay. Um, I think we'll, Solosh gave very nice explanation what she sees in, in some of the horses, and it really fits yeah. nicely with what we see in, in them. In ECBM, okay. Um, so who, 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 what horses are affected by this? Who is actually being affected, and how often is it occurring? And um, we know that it happens in about 30% of all the thoroughbreds. That's what research has been telling us. The, the same we see in about the same amount of warm blots, or we did see it, depending on what kind of breeding they have. And that's why the genetics are coming in. Um, there is like more of that occurring. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so there is like some of it is more is getting more prominent. Sometimes we have even 50% of the horses being affected. Um, that doesn't mean they're not good for sport or anything. That just yeah. means they're weaker. We have like horses now, the modern sport horse has a weaker attachment of the ligamentum nuche. We know that this is kind of like getting weaker, like our the the little fascia that we have there the fascia attachment is in in pony breeds or ancient breeds is very strong is is no longer there we we bred it back because we bred for flexibility and special gates like you know flashy gates and not for stability uh, the other thing is so this is also reducing our stability then we have changes to the bones like ecvm where we have again attachment problems in addition a lot of the modern sport horses are hyper flexible you know that yourself so they can do movements that they actually shouldn't be doing to be healthy um just because their connective tissue has a different um quality they have more type um three collagen that is really elastic instead of type one collagen that is actually helping to carry and um, give forces over like is is there to to help store forces and they release them like we would have it in a tendon. Mm -hmm. That's the difference between a deep flexor tendon and a superficial flexor tendon. Mm -hmm. We couldn't have the same quality of a superficial flexor tendon everywhere and then it's expected mm -hmm. to be stable. But that's what happened when we're breeding for those super flashy gates and those super elastic horses. That's why you see three-year-old horses who are actually touching with their fetlock at the trot and the ground. This is just hyperflexibility. Another thing that makes that whole problem more prominent. It's, we just have to, you know, like ECVM itself, if it's not too bad, if I'm not missing ribs, the horses who are missing ribs, they really have a problem because they will never be equal left and right. That's why it's so important that when we do X-ray for the lower cervical region, that we always do it far enough back that we have T1 on there and we okay. also check for the ribs. This can be done out in the field. It doesn't, it, this doesn't need a super high, um, strong um, X-ray machine. The normal X-ray machines that we have, if you know the right technique, are able to give us these informations out in the field. Mm. That that's great because I actually thought it was difficult to diagnose correctly. So no, diagnosis no. is not not that challenging. We can do it. No, well, you just okay. have to know how to read the X-rays mm. and what you're looking for, and okay. that's now getting more and more. Um, how do I say? Known by by lots of vets, and they're able to do it. And you have just okay. have to know which angles you have to have to actually be able to see that. It's not okay. that complicated, honestly. If the horse okay, is fantastic. Behave, you don't even need sedation for it. If otherwise, okay. just have a little bit of sedation. So it's like actually standing there, not moving too much mm -hmm. and you can do it. But that can be done out in the field with a normal mm -hmm. X-ray generator with a decent plate. Okay. This is, yeah, this is very interesting. And you've made me think of hypermobility now, because 
um, that is in people that is a syndrome that you can have and in dogs it's also been identified as a syndrome and i've wondered if if it's something that is in horses that we just haven't um put a label on yet and it is affecting them um and we just are not you know in the, in the warm blood that is something where what is like more and more discussed because like you see often those horses who are literally able to put their chin on their chest Mm -hmm. and they're still kind of like being able to to look straight forward this yes. is like this shouldn't be possible and okay. they can do it horses a healthy horse should not be able to put his neck <laughs> on the chest on the chest like if if they're that high up if you do carrot stretch and slow down at the carpus yes but not yeah. on the chest yeah you shouldn't be able to be to do that and it's the same when you see them trotting, that if they are at the trot and the fetlock literally drops down to the ground, mm -hmm. and this is like just not normal, this is not healthy, mm -hmm. and this is a problem. These horses need way more muscle strength and core muscle strength to be stable, and it takes way longer for them to actually be stable and not damage their joints and ligaments than when mm -hmm. you have one that's more stable, but not as flashy. Yeah, These, yeah, it was. I was at the CPD about ECVM, and somebody said, like, 20 years ago, we had the um, we had the kind of like horses who were like a what did you call them? German, German train tracks, you know, like <laughs> great, strong, hard, and all yeah. you had to do is like push from behind and hold in the front, and they would go into a nice bend yeah now we do have something that's more like a flexible willow that means yes because <laughs> if you push from behind and hold in the front it's just gonna do that in the middle go, yeah, yeah because there's no stability to it so, so it the needs first training to get the stability back mm -hmm. and then you actually can start to to work on it. and now we go with that and get that because and that actually and that actually means that you know where 20 years ago and longer we used to it was right to say you should take a horse through the the basics of training for six eight ten years before they achieve a high level of comp competition or collection that's even more relevant now because they don't have that stability it will take them even longer to develop that and we're doing the exact opposite with them we're just going yeah. faster high into higher levels of competition so that's yeah that's something the to problem think about is we bred them to be more compliant for reading for writing yeah. we bred them to be more fleshy and more flexible for the gates this makes mm -hmm. it easier for them to do on a how do i say if you look at a lot of the sport horses today who are going Grand Prix, they're not doing a true Piaf. They're not doing a true mm. Passage because that you can see they're not stable. They're doing constantly that. Mm. They're not doing it in a diagonal. They can't stabilize themselves, but they're at the high level. The problem is these horses are wrecking their body doing that while they're in a hyperflexion in the front and still a Kufos is on the back. That's mm. usually how you see them. And they're not mm. balanced. The balance comes from the rider. Mm. A horse who is mm. doing such lectures should be balanced in itself. It shouldn't need the rider to have the legs on mm. so it can come out onto a, a long line in the middle. And you can see that they often come out and then, and then they stride like this. Mm. This is just a horse that is not strong in its core muscle and balance itself. This is coming from an excellent rider. But that doesn't yes. mean... And, and that will wreck the horses because the stability is missing. If the stability is missing, we're overloading our joints and ligaments because 80% of the stability of our skeleton is coming from muscles. And mm -hmm. if the muscle and connective tissue is weak, we're going to mm -hmm. get hock problems, suspensory problems, all those back problems, <coughs> everything <coughs> is going on. Yeah. yeah, and that's what we see, right? That's what we're seeing clinically is just one problem after the next after the next and it just becomes this whole bag of conditions that we're trying to manage in these 
performance horses younger and younger and younger that's uh that's it's very concerning it's very concerning thank you to our facebook user that's shared a little bit about um a recent case that that she saw um where she went to fit a bit and then had to stop because she was like we're not we're not getting anywhere um with signs that are looking that are sounding similar to what martina is describing thank you um and adrian uh, Tomkinson says, I'm glad to hear you say that, Martina, that I'm not the only one who thinks that about the GP and PSG dress dressage horses. The riders hold everything together and the horse cannot be relaxed or go long and low. Um, and Patty says, are you saying that breeding for hypermobility is related to the increased incidence of ECVM? No, these are two different things. These are two different things. I think they're genetic, not the same. The problem is if we have an ECBM horse and it's also hyperflexible on top, this is really a disaster because we have two things that should be stable that are not. So if they have one or the other, it will be able for rehab that we can either work on muscle strength to stabilize it or we can use like that is like equal and there there is a correct anatomy and can work to strengthen then the muscle and and the connective tissue with the right training but if both is not there we really have a problem and i know there is two research article out who say oh ecbm is there since a long time yes it is no since a long time i think the earliest mentioning that you find is 1850 that they do have cervical malformation and it was noted by some breeders because the folds who were heavily affected were usually dead or died early oh. and uh, yes we have a very similar thing in cows where it's um where it is a contracted syndrome and these uh, holstein cows and these usually die in the early times it is at the moment they're looking into it that contracted fall syndrome is just a very severe form of ECBM because those falls, um, from what I know and what I got told from the researchers currently, uh, is that they are all missing their ribs. So there's no attachment, and that's why those falls have those contracted legs, and that's why they can't stretch them out, and you get like um, problems falling because they can't stretch the legs. The muscle okay. attachment is just not correct. So this is a very severe form, and that's what they're looking into it now. So they just need a few more folds before they can publish the paper. But that's some of the findings from some of the researchers from the Netherlands. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, so those that have joined us live, it's really great to have you guys. Please ask any questions that you have or share any thoughts and comments. We'd love to hear from you. Um, Martina, what can we do with these horses? Uh, maybe before you actually answer that, how like do we get you know functioning you mentioned there are functioning horses that can carry on um they can compete and then all the way through the scale what are the different kind of severities that we might find with this condition you can have anything from just having a little bit of a problem to go more to one side than the other to literally being so lame and so sore that they can't put their leg down, that they literally have paralyzed leg. Um, it, it is one of the clinical signs that these horses literally just crash in full gallop with their rider, be it like, you know, and not stumbling, just not get the leg forward. It is very typical for those horses that two, three days ago, before it happens, they start to be stiff to one side. And then when you see the videos, you can see in the slow motion how these horses lose protrusion. So the leg is not just getting the full extent. And then after three, four steps like that, it just can't place the leg and they just tumble. And that can be very, very dangerous. It can be with rider. It can be without rider. It can be during jumping. It can be during dressage. It can be just out in the field. And they just okay. lose it because they're... They, when it is severe, it just, um, I know they, in Germany, uh, Dr. Katharina Ross, she they, they dissected a few, and they found in these horses who were severely affected, when the rib was missing, that even the plexus brachialis was like hooked up on one of those rudimentary ribs, and it just, that must be just horrible, because it just 
gives them like an absolute shock on the plexus brachialis and it's just like they lose all the sensitivity and all the ability to put their leg down so okay. it, it has some very severe um implications for the horses and for the riders if they are affected so if you have a horse that is constantly stumbling and you check the feet and the feet like are okay see that was like me thinking that was them um, uh. <laughs> <I should be. laughs> so i put an alarm <laughs> just for the wrong time i'm very sorry about that um, okay <laughs> so if you have that um then it will be really worth to look into the lower cervicals these horses often have like multiple lameness issues everywhere in their body but nobody mm -hmm. looks at the lower cervicals these are often it is seen also in foals i i have videos of foals who are four months old and they're still ataxic and not able to coordinate their body properly like you would expect it from a one or two day old foal but they still mm -hmm. have the same problems in transition from counter down to a trot you see them they're like probably mm -hmm. going all over and these foals often have problems to start nursing or to get up. Mm -hmm. they, they want to, they just nurse from one side, but not from the other. These mm -hmm. are all things where we already see it in, in babies. Um, okay. Later in the sport horses, these horses are often absolutely brilliant up till four or five years mm -hmm. when you actually start to work them more. They need to engage okay. the core muscles more. They need to do more. And then the problems start to happen. Okay. okay, so what can we do for these horses? How can we help them, support them, improve their function? Um, what kinds of exercises should we, should we be encouraging owners to do with them? How can we help them? It depends on the severity and what kind you have. If it's just a transposition, it's really like, core muscle st uh, strengths of exercises, be like sure foot pads, um, cookie stretches, and um, anything like, you know, the, the bands, like everything that you can do to help them to get core stabilization. Mm -hmm. It is really important for those horses to really work. What is a good thing, what I found very interesting is like what well, one of the other rehab vets told me who works intensive um, with them, uh, my Britt Klevitz, she's um, one of the vets from Germany. And uh, if you put those horses out in the field and they start to fall apart, this is a sign that you have a very severe underlying issue because they can't keep themselves strong. Um, horses who, who fall apart when they are on a spell, this is something where you really think, because often they say, oh, he had a tendon injury or, or there's something, just put him out for a few months in the field and then mm. they should come back better. If they start to fall apart, that will be also something where I think you need to look into because like, why can't they keep themselves straight and strong? Mm. So anything for core muscle exercises for those cases where not too much affected are important. Mm. Then another important part is retraining of the biomechanics. That means these horses need to learn to use their body correctly. They need to learn to use their serratus more. They need to learn to let go of their trapezius and, and splenius because like if they do that, they can't mm -hmm. actually do this. So they first need to let go here uh, to engage here. So it is really, important that you get a biomechanically correct training for those horses to use their thoracic sling and their abdominals and everything that they can do in addition to help to, to support those structures who are not that strong. Mm -hmm. So the correct use for whatever you do, and often this is also like when you're riding them, you have to be aware that you ride them correctly. They need the saddle to fit. They need the teeth to be absolutely 100% okay, same as the feet, because if they're not, their system is so fragile, if mm -hmm. it's not 100% correct, they fall apart. If they're mm -hmm. hypermobile, it's even worse. If they have in addition PSSM, it gets even worse. So you have to mm -hmm. then change the nutrition, make sure they have lots of vitamin E, they don't get any carbohydrates or just no starch like just like long chained carbohydrate. So it can be really challenging if you want to keep them 
And sometimes even though everything we try, even with neck injections to get the inflammation down, uh, in Germany, they're also doing quite a few of um, baskets or something like that just to stabilize the neck so we don't get those, those problems or they open up the facets. Um, because when we have those, that transposition from C6 onto C7, it is possible to interfere with the nerves that are coming out. Mm -hmm. So it just depends on what kind you have. But strong core muscle and anything you can do to help them to use their body correctly in a biomechanical healthy way, and not in that compensation. First, mm -hmm. you need to get them out of that compensation pattern, and then you can you you can help them Cheryl May Davies uses rams to feed them on because they often tend to stand like that yeah so if they stand at the slight slant when you feed them they often put the legs equally and then okay they can, uh, some horses can't get their neck down so you better yeah. start feeding them up top some horses yeah. can't get their neck up so you start down it's just you need to adapt to each horse and their needs and then go from there it's, it's unfortunately, it's such a versatile mm. uh, field because depending on what kind is affected of that and, and what is the rest of the body doing that you need to adapt it. There is horses mm. who are severely affected who have like really, really good riders and are able to, to compensate. Mm. And they're competing Grand Prix and internationally and you wouldn't know it if you don't know how to look and see how they are compensating. Mm -hmm. But like mm -hmm. they're absolutely there doing it. That's why it's so important that we develop the that genetic testing and see mm -hmm. which lines are affected so we do not breed more carriers and more affected horses because okay. the, the numbers are increasing exponentially um, from mm -hmm. 20 years back to now. Yeah. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit more about uh, the treat stretches or the carrot stretches, because we've been talking about mobility and stability. And it's always kind of a question, you know, these these carrot stretches or treat stretches or dynamic mobilization exercises, whatever you want to call them, they are taking the neck through kind of the maximum range of motion. Do we want to do that? Do we want to go through the whole range of motion or would is it better to use exercises that are going to encourage stability within a straighter, more functional range of the cervical spine? It's again, it depends how severe is the horse affected and what do you want to get? If I have a hypermobile horse, I'm definitely not going to do the stretches down to I don't know where mm -hmm. but there's nothing wrong about asking it to come down towards the hooves mm -hmm. and engage its chest and trying to to get that one up often they can't do that mm -hmm. they often are not able to get their head down and do that because their um longus collie is too weak or not attached properly so they can't because this muscle needs to contract so they're mm -hmm. actually able to get the head fully down because okay. like we have, we have in the, if you think here is the head, yeah. here is the head <laughs> and you have the neck like that attached, yeah. right? So down here, we have this curve to get mm -hmm. the head down. This needs to come up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is our longest collie who contracts and together with the serratus to help to lift it up. So it can actually lift the leg, the neck down because you need mm -hmm. something to lift up C6, C7 to get it full down to extension. Okay. Horses who are sedated, usually when that's still holding, they get their head down perhaps to the carpus. But mm -hmm. if it needs to go down to the ground, they need to actively lift up the chest and get that okay. down. And this is okay. really difficult for them. Okay, so that forward down posture, we want yes. to be encourage them to encouraging them to go there and to stretch there. Um, and Adrian asks, what about forward up? Do we want to be stretching them forward and up through extension? And lift that if they're mm -hmm. able to do that. Yes, also forward straight, like where they really okay. have to open here. It's you can also do it to the side as long as they're not 
cheating. A lot of the horses I see, you know, they can go back to their head or, or to yeah. their head, but they cheat. They turn yeah. around their head and go like that. This is not a true flexion. And this is not mm. when they do the flexion, when we do the exercises with them, we have to make sure they're biomechanically correct and not a mm. compensation pattern. So if I ask them to come around, I want them to lift the medial thorax to be able to go that because the thorax have to come up in the medial side to be able to go like that mm. if they want to do it in the correct way. If they're going to do it like that, that's cheating and that's like making your problem worse. So it mm. is down to us to do those exercises in a biomechanical correct way and not just, oh, biggest range of motion is perfect. No, if we do mm. just a little bit, but it needs to be biomechanically correct and it needs to activate the right muscles. You can do that while they're mm. walking. Do it in a walk, keep their head mm. like a chest height or a little bit higher. And then you can actually, like while you have them walking, you can activate their abdominals, you can activate serratus, you can activate uh, latissimus, and you can actually physically relax with your hand mm -hmm. up there, like if you want to work on, on delta ideos or splenius or whatever, where they need to let go because they're that. And they need to come okay. down so they can do this. So these are like just biomechanical correct movement is the really important thing. Oh. And it doesn't matter if you do it ridden, if you do it long lining, if you do it statically, it's just that is the really important bit. Once okay. they're out of the pain cycle, we need to stop the pain for them to do that. Always first. Okay, <laughs> good. Yes. All right. So then, things like, um, yeah, like Celeste's work with the with the thoracic sling is really yes. useful because it, it yes. really goes back to the basics and rebuilding that foundation of the correct use of the thoracic sling. That would be amazing here. Um, Adrian also asks lifting the opposite forelimb and pushing on the sternum to lift from there. So, yeah, I think if they can, it depends. They can correctly if they can do, do that. it. Yeah. Yeah. Because that but would be quite think advanced. About if, you have, if you have a horse that doesn't have a rib on one side and has mm -hmm. a very strong one on the other side and, and you ask them to do that, if you push them from the wrong side, they will collapse. So you can do it to the side where they're strong, but they might not be able to do it to the side where they're weak. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then if we use that exercise, we would actually be increasing the asymmetry um, if, if it's and, rotating not, while and not it's doing it, building yes. support. Okay. okay. Yeah. If you can get them to uh, that movement while they are biomechanically correct and are able to do it in a really like balanced strong core muscle then absolutely yes those horses can do that but if we see when i lift up just the leg and it does that then it's obviously not strong enough to do that exercise so it really depends there is no wrong and there is no right it's just it needs to be correct for the situation and what the patient can handle in that situation uh Okay, perfect. Um, and then Patty asks about, are you referring to correct versus inverted rotation? And I'm assuming that's when we're getting the, the deeper or the longer carrot stretches and then we're getting rotation through the spine instead of, um, yeah. That's when we're asking for it. But they still, when they get the rotation through the spine, they still are correcting their body. If, if that's the mm -hmm. same, like when you do collective work and you do side passes, the horses mm -hmm. are first correcting their thorax and then they do the bend and then they come over mm -hmm. if they do it correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, okay. you know, it's really exactly the same. If you do it biomechanically correct, so they're able to stabilize. I have horses mm -hmm. doing those advanced exercises once they're strong enough on three legs. I can lift up one leg and they're still going to do the full exercise. And it doesn't matter if it's a front leg or a hind leg that I'm lifting up. And they still can do the thing correctly and they stay parallel with their head and they go down and activate their core muscles. And you can see through going that through the whole um, abdominal and core sling. Okay. And, and that's just like exercises building up from very weak from doing that and mm. that while standing, even if it's just with or with us, and we get the thoracic sling to open and do something, or do the yeah. same from the sacrum, where they just have to activate less, 
-hmm. it's, it's little things that you have to do and then just go with what the patient can do. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much, Martina. I'm going to have to finish us off now because my, I don't know if you can hear my kids in the background. I unfortunately can't ignore them any longer. And I have a Ridgeback standing here against me saying, please, mom, it's time. So <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll have to, I'll have to cut us short, but thank you so much for your time today, guys. Thank you for joining us live. It was so great to chat with all of you. Please, if you're watching this as a recording, let us know where you are, share your thoughts or questions, and we can always come back and answer them after this live. Um, feel free to share this recording with anyone that you think would benefit from hearing what we've spoken about. Um, yeah, and thank you so much to those that have had to leave us earlier. Um, I hope you get to catch the recording. It's been great having you, Martina. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.